Good evening, New Birth. Thank you so much for joining in with us today. Uh, thank you who are all online watching. Uh, your prayers, comments, amens are greatly appreciated and greatly needed. Thank you so much for putting your trust and faith in Jesus. Look, uh, for those who said they wanted to stay in because it might rain, look, I, I haven't seen uh, 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 any rain like it was this morning or this afternoon. So if you're on your way, we're praying for a traveling grace and arriving uh, mercy and uh, pray that God gets you here safely. And once again, thank you for your support. And thank you for all who brought their children for our youth ministry today as well. And I can't thank you enough. And I wanted to uh, uh, tell us again, like I do every time we uh, open up, that we're here at New Birth, where we're located at 444 West Ledbetter Drive in Dallas, Texas, zip code 75224, telephone number, area code 214-374-0828, where we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Savior of the world, the Son of the living God, who died on the cross and rose again on the third day for our justification. And if you too put your trust and faith in him, no matter where you're at, no matter what you've done, you too can be saved. So that's what we practice and that's what we believe and that's what we teach here at New Birth. And we accept and we welcome everyone into the house of the Lord and we ask that you come. And as I just want to ask for a little bit of your time in my introduction today before uh, we go and into, start into our lesson, and we'll be in Zechariah chapter uh, 5 and 6 from our uh, great character study a book Bible, uh, a, a, not Bible, but character study book that we're studying, and we're studying the character Zechariah, and I want to, uh, we've been able to review the, pa the paper that we have in our book, but it's nothing like being able to go to the scripture and going through it verse by verse. And if you allow me, as we do a study our great characters Bible, we not only will we review the paper that you have, but after we review the paper like we have, we will always go into the scripture and go verse by verse and break it down and for we can get a better understanding of God's word. Um, and I just want us to ask for, continue to ask for the prayers and support for the family of Sister Helen McNeil. Well, where we'll be having her funeral here at the church uh, this Friday at 11 a.m. and uh, we will have her repast uh, at the in the fellowship hall immediately afterwards. And I'm asking all the men and women that can help and stay to help clean up afterwards, please do to help the family because we still have our tea and hat uh, event that same Saturday as well, uh, the next Saturday as well, and we don't want to overwork. Our, 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 our wonderful members who are working so diligently, let's be there to help them out. And I want to thank Sister Hicks for and everyone who was involved for the successful drive uh, through food giveaway that we had yesterday. And I want to also pray for, uh, continue to ask for your prayer as I will be the keynote speaker this Saturday at 10 a.m. for the 55th, celebra uh, 55th celebration of the Betty E. Joshua Scholarship Prayer Breakfast on behalf of the Metropolitan Baptist Ministers' Wives and Widows. And the location is at the Hilton Garden Inn Hotel at 800 North Main Street Road in Duncanville, Texas. And it begins at uh, 10 a.m. We'd love to uh, have you there. We'd love for your support if you can make it. And if anybody would like to go, please contact uh, Sister La Lady Stephanie Pryor, my mother, and my beautiful, amazing wife, First Lady Sister Michelle Pryor. If anyone would like to go, please contact them uh, on Facebook. Do you know they're on Facebook? Or if you got their uh, cell phones, or you can text them, uh, but contact them as well, and we can help arrange uh, for your support to be there. And this Saturday, uh, let's all come and support the Dallas uh, Regional Missionary Baptist Association Gen General Mission, the Tea and Hat extra, uh, Extravaganza, uh, from 2 to 5 p.m. Uh, th that's a very special day for me. I'll still be there with me and my family, even though that's Emmanuel's uh, fourth birthday. Emmanuel will be turning four years old. So I I'll be having a great, very uh, impactful, very busy Saturday. I'll be speaking in Duncanville, uh, giving my son a birthday gift, coming back to the... <laughs> Uh, event here at New Birth and then getting ready to preach two sermons on Sunday. Uh, so uh, thank you for your prayers and also pray for me this coming Tuesday. I'll be re able to tell us the church again on Sunday. But come uh, and join in with us at uh, the at St. Philip's Missionary Baptist Church for the Dallas Baptist, Dallas Baptist Ministers Union Citywide Revival. I'll be the speaker at the, uh, the lecture speaker at 12 p.m. noonday service uh, this Tuesday at St. Philip's 
uh, Missionary Baptist Church, which is the address is 6000 Single Hills Drive in Dallas, Texas. And we know New Birth. That's literally five minutes up the street from uh, New Birth. It's, it's just a hop and a skip uh, up the street from us. And last but not least, let's continue to be in prayer and be ready to come out in huge numbers and huge support. I, I'm asking for the, the members to invite our family, friends, uh, and all that you can to come out on the fourth Sunday of this month as I'll be celebrating, uh, me and my wife will be celebrating our first annual Pastors and Wife annual day. And uh, Pastor Robert M. Castle will be coming all the way from Wichita Falls, Texas, and he'll be bringing his congregation along to celebrate and worship with us and uh, on that great occasion and preach a word. And I'm asking that everyone come and that everyone give $100 or be prepared, start saving for the fourth Sunday of this month on the 28th to give $100 more than you normally would. And I just can't thank uh, Brother Stanley, Deacon Stanley, and the pastor's aid enough for helping me and my wife and my family feel loved and feel wanted as a, a pastor here at New Birth. And I'm grateful for the pastor's aid, for their continued prayers, and for their continued encouragement. Uh, and I'm asking that the entire church, once again, come out in full number the, the last of Sunday of this month on the uh, 28th because that that's it's a very special Sunday for me and and as you know this is the first year of everything for your pastor without his best friend without uh my father and uh so so grateful uh for the church and the love and because we haven't missed a beat and we see that God is up to something but uh, I know that's going to be a very special very uh difficult Sunday for me personally being able to uh, sit back whenever I don't have to step out or step up uh, as the pastor and preach that Sunday or, or lead out that Sunday it gives me time to uh, really be able to grieve or allow the Holy Spirit to just move in me and let my emotions uh, do what they need to do for the moment and so I know it's going to be a special occasion because Pastor Robert Castle had a great relationship with my father and uh, I appreciate you, New Birth. It said I have my heart. It, it, it really, y'all have helped me in this time, and I, I love you, love you so much. If I can really give everyone a hug and kiss, you know I will, uh, because you continue to support me uh, as pastor in this very difficult season, and I want to thank you so much. And lastly, let's keep Sister Sharon Green and Sister, uh, she, she just had her surgery. Everything went well, y'all. She's doing good. She's recuperating. Uh, I heard that she wanted to get here where Brother Green said, no, nah, you stay at home. Uh, she's already uh, moving around, trying to do things that the doctor said we need rest. So, Sister Green, if you're listening right now, rest, rest, rest. And uh, thank you so much for uh, your, your continued support and continued prayers, even in this trying season of her having to trust God. Uh, you saw how she continued to serve God, and God blessed her to have a very successful surgery. And I want to continue to keep Sister Pat Hewitt in our uh, uh, prayers, can, can continue to keep her lifted. We know she's always online watching us when she's not here, so let's keep her lifted up. And let's keep our founding first lady, uh, Sister Alma Jewel Pryor, in our prayers. Um, thank you so much for the the length, the time. Uh, I do, I do, Y'all know I do not want to take advantage of your time, so thank you so much for uh, lending me the extra time to speak to you and now let us open up in prayer father god thank you so much for everything that you've done for us lord thank you for the good and the bad lord i ask you today as we study the life of zechariah and the book of zechariah as we see the as we talk about your first and second comings here on earth lord to reign and uh, supreme as the ruler of this earth Lord, I ask you just to help prepare our hearts and minds to receive you. Lord, I ask you just to prepare our hearts and minds to uh, continue to live for you each and every day in spite of the things around us, in spite of the trials and tribulations, in spite of the circumstances, Lord. Continue to let us lean and depend on you for everything, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. And once again, like I always like to do, to give us a background because Every day, new birth, we see it's growing. Every Sunday, we're having some uh, members come to be baptized or rededicate their lives or join through Christian experience. And that's every time we, get, we stand up to speak and to whenever a pastor or a preacher stands up to speak God's word, there's always someone listening who don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and personal Savior of their life. And there's always somebody when, uh, who 
just did, who doesn't know uh, the book uh, that we're studying or haven't been here to understand how we got here to chapter five. And I believe it's very important for me to always give the review to where we are and to how we got here now. Because Zechariah was written during the reign of Cyrus and when more than 50,000 uh, Jews returned to Palestine uh, or Palestine from Babylon in 538 and they laid the foundation of the temple in 536. But the opposition stalled the work for about 15 years. And when King Darius came to the throne in 521, it confirmed Cyrus' decree and Zechariah, like Haggai, encouraged the people to finish the temple, which they did in 516. And it's always important for, for me to tell you how Zechariah predicted and the book of Zechariah, it predicts and talks about Jesus' uh, second coming, first and second coming, more than any other prophet in the Bible. And the only one that comes close to speaking about Jesus' first and second coming uh, in visions is Isaiah. He, he might have actually wrote a little bit more as I've been studying, but I truly believe Zechariah does the best job of illustrating uh, to us in Scripture the first and second comings of Christ more than any other Bible, even in Revelation. Revelations. You know, everyone say if you want to know about Jesus reign on earth, go to Revelations. But if you really want to know about his first and second coming, as we study these 14 chapters of Zechariah, we will see exactly in great detail how the Lord plans on doing it. And remember, for review purposes, uh, for those who may be turning in for the first time, we have been studying this book of Zechariah. And we've already studied chapter one, two, three and four. And today, I believe we'll probably just get to chapters five and six and possibly a little further if the Lord will bless us to do so. And in chapter one, remember, it was a call to, uh, to a repentance. Uh, Israel were, has been in bondage for years, 70 years of captivity in Babylon and in uh, Persian by the Persian Empire. And now in Zechariah's vision from the Lord, it was a, in chapter one, a call to repent where he saw uh, the visions of the myrtle and the four horns, which represented the four nations that uh, went and came and conquered uh, Israel and Judah. And then chapter two, it shows us how Jesus is building a perfect city without walls for the entire world to see. So first he called them to repent. Then he let them know, you repent, trust in me, because uh, I'm going to get the nations that did you wrong. I'm going to get the nations that took advantage of my people. And I'm building a perfect city. I'm preparing a perfect place where there will be no more pain, no more sickness, no more fear. I'm preparing the perfect place where I'm the protector and I'm the ruler. You don't have to worry about anything. And then in chapter 3, he, he goes even further to show him the vision of the cleansing of the high priest Joshua, showing him of the sacrifice that uh, God is making to, by sending his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. And remember, also shows us uh, because of his sacrifice, now when we stand before God in judgment, just like Joshua, the high priest in that vision, stood before uh, God. And remember, the devil, our adversary, uh, our accuser, stood right there in the midst of this moment of the high priest trying to accuse Joshua of the sin that he was guilty of. Because we're all uh, sinners saved by grace. None of us in here are perfect. And that was the example of what we'll go through where God told him, I rebuke thee, Satan. Get from me, Satan. This is my, uh, my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter. They put their trust and faith in me. So uh, we have already been washed in the blood of the lamb, and we can see that in chapter 3, um, even though that was a vision of something to come to Zechariah for his time. And in chapter 4, we saw the vision of the golden lampstand uh, and how God will do it, and how he revealed his temple for them. And now here we are in Zechariah chapter 5, about the vision of the flying scroll and uh, the vision of the woman in the basket, and the, which was a representation of evil, which was a representation of sin. And let's read, I'm going to read the entire chapter of, of 5, and then we're going to go through it verse by verse. So in chapter 5 of Zechariah, in verse 1, it says, Then I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a flying roll. And he said unto me, what seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. The length thereof is 20 cubits, and the breadth thereof is 10 cubits. Then he said unto me, this is the cause, this is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For everyone that stilleth shall be cut off as one that sighed according to it. 
and every one that swerveth shall be cut off as one that sighed according to it. I will bring it forth, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter into the house of the thief, and enter into the house of him that swore falsely by my name. And it shall remain in the midst of his house, and it shall consume it with the timber thereof, and with the stones thereof. Then the angel that talked with, with me went forth and said or with me, Lift up th now thine eyes, and see what is this that goeth forth. And I said, What is it? And he said, this is a, in my scripture, it says infina, but it's uh, translated as a uh, basket. So we're just going to say basket. This is a basket that goes forth. He said, moreover, this is their resemblance through all the earth. And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead. And this was, and this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the basket. And he said, this is wickedness. And he cast it into the midst of the basket, and he cast the weight of the lead upon the mouth thereof. Then lifted up I mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came out two women, and the wind was in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up their basket between the earth and the heaven. Then I said to the angel that talked with me, Whether do they bear this basket? And he said unto me, To build it in a house in the land of Shinar, and it shall be established and set there upon her, uh, set there upon her own base. So look what it says again in verse 1 when he says, Then I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a flying roll. You see, ain't it interesting how God's visions and dreams that he normally gives us, how he can always take on some type of weird imagery. Or, or how God, when he gives us our vision, it's always some type of weird image or uh, it's always some type of message. But it's a, a message in a way that only that only if you if you're not reading the scripture, if you're not on your knees praying, if you're not uh, in the will of God, you really won't know what he's talking about. When when Pharaoh receives his dream from God, his vision and he couldn't interpret it and he was confused is because he wasn't in the will of the Lord and only. Joseph, who was in prison, could uh, interpret that dream because he was he was in the will of the Lord. He was walking and talking with the Lord by faith. So when we're walking and talking uh, with the Lord, when we're praying and when we're serving him, he can give us those visions. He can give us those dreams and it can be made more clear when we're actually walking and talking with him. But just notice how even in Joseph's dreams that he had with his brothers, what a weird way to use hay, to use the moon and the stars, to use all the things of this land to show him how your family and uh, the people of the, uh, Egypt will, or the, of the world will bow down to you and you will be the leader amongst your brothers and your, your family and you will lead the next generation. He could have just said it. He could have just simply said, you're going to be the next leader. Your brother's going to bow down to you. I'm going to make you king. But he did it in the, in the way of a dream, even uh, with the, the bakers, that, the baker, that, a man that came to the uh, prison to see Joseph. Uh, he was dead or he was hanging on the, uh, the, the uh, on a, a type of, uh, I want to say, uh, it's not crucifixion, but standing on some type of, how they had him hung up there, and he saw in that dream how that crow was going to come eat him alive. And uh, Joseph had to let him know, you about to die. But one of them, he had to let him know, hey, you about to be released from here. Uh, 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 Pharaoh's going to come and release you. So, you know, we have to be walking in the will of the Lord if we want to really want to understand what the Lord is trying to tell us and pray on it first. You know, don't just receive a vision from the Lord and just run with it, but pray on it. Talk to him before he can make it clear to you. And in verse 2 it said, And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. The length thereof is 20 cubits, and the breadth thereof 10 cubits. You see, this wasn't no small scroll, but this was a, about a scroll uh, big and huge, some 15 by 30 feet. And we don't know what was written on the scroll either, but what we do know is that the scroll has writings on both sides. And the Lord was going to reveal to us today uh, what the meaning of the scroll was to Zechariah. And he did it in verse 3, where it says, Then said he unto me, This is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For every one that stilleth shall be cut off as one on this, on this side according to it. And every one that swerveth shall be cut off as on that side according to it. You see, 
this scribe that Zechariah was seeing was a scribe that was describing God's judgment. It was this, it was a scribe that was describing the judgment that's about to come. And, and we know to be cut off, as it says in the scriptures, means to be removed or to be cut off means to be cleaned out. So God was saying to Zechariah that I'm going to purge this land and, and I'm going to clean it out. I'm going to cut off and I, I'm, I'm going to uh, do what needs to be done in, in, in terms of the curse that was on Israel due to their captivity of 70 years. So God was saying to the people who have been uh, been stealing at the, who he had been he was telling them who had been falsely uh, 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 t- test of, uh, giving false testimonies on his name who, who had been going against them and telling people not to believe. He was saying, I'm going to cut you off. Your time is coming. It might seem like you're winning. I try to tell the youth now as a teacher you know, that you, you, you think that because you bad, you ain't got to go or you can't stay in class. You, no one can make you do no work. Uh, no one can make you uh, be respectful. You're going to cuss out who you feel like cussing out. You're going to get on your phone when you feel like getting on your phone. I just warn them and let them know all the time. We'll see how long it lasts. You're going to turn 18 one day. Life going to get real one day. Your bills going to come one day. And, and we're going to see uh, if you if you paid it if, if, if you're going to take heed to what the Lord was trying to tell you and then we can see in verse 4 where it says I will bring it forth saith the Lord of hosts and it shall enter into the house of the thief and into the house of him that swear falsely by my name and it shall remain in the midst of his house and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof see once again this was just another promise that God's judgment was coming and that it, and this was going to be given to uh, Zechariah telling him that God is going to do a very detailed work in the cleansing of his land because it's a lot of evil. As we'll see, this, this land is full of sin, it's full of evil. So God has a lot of work to, but he's letting you know I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it on my timing. And God has even more to show Zechariah about the sins and the iniquity in the land in this same uh, chapter because we, when we read verses 5 through 8 it says then the angel that talked with me went forth and said unto me lift up now thine eyes and see what it what is what is this that goeth forth and I said what is it and he said this is a, a, a basket that goeth forth and he said moreover this is their resemblance through all the earth and behold there was lifted up a talent of lead And this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the basket. And he said, this is wickedness. And he cast it in the midst of the the basket, and he cast the weight of the lead upon the mouth thereof. See, God was just showing uh, Zechariah how he is in control of all the wickedness. God was showing Zechariah, I'm still in control of all the sin. I'm still in control of all the evil, even though you can see that it's a whole bunch because this wasn't no small basket. When I say basket, we, we might be thinking of an Easter basket. You may be thinking of a, a basket people can th- pick up eggs with, but this was a huge basket, a, a, a basket big enough where a whole woman could sit <laughs> fit inside this basket to describe the, the evil that was in the world. And God was showing him look how I'm in control of this it looked like it's a lot it looked like it's no control but I'm in control of this I close it I open it I move it to and fro how I please Uh, I'm in control so don't worry and uh, even though it's a large amount of evil sin in the world you can still trust me and look what he said uh, in verses 9 to 11 and you you know it's to be true what I just said because he says then I lifted, then lifted I up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came out two women, and the the wind was in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up their basket between the earth and the heaven. Then said I to the angel that talked with me, whether do these bear the uh, baskets? And he said unto me, to build it in the house in the land of Shinar. And it shall be established and set there upon her own base. And Shinar uh, is translated Babylon, which is a type of the world. So uh, it's amazing. Uh, this was an amazing way to show Zechariah 
how uh, the, of the removal of sin into a whole nother land. And because in ancient times, like I said, the word Shinar meant Babylon. And this was a picture. This was a vision of idolatry that was such a huge part of their culture of Israel and Judah, which was why they, God allowed the other nations to come over and take them and come conquer them in the first place. And why he allowed them to be enslaved for 70 years because of all the idolatry, because of all the sin that was in the land of Israel and Judah. But after they came back from the land, the good thing is they never dealt with that kind of uh, idolatry again, especially in this vision. And they did a much better job of not bowing down to idols uh, as they were getting ready to uh, rebuild this temple. They did a much better job of not ba bowing down to uh, in idolatry to idols of metal, uh, wood and stone. And in this vision, they were literally cured of the idolatry of seeing in their heart that they had. So God has given him this fascinating picture of envision of this sin and evilness and whiskey, uh, wickedness that is being kept in this basket and how he's taking it to the land of Babylon and wh uh, where it's going to be further exalted. See, God was showing him that the evilness and the wickedness in this world one day, uh, it, it'll, it'll be no more. And one day when I get a hold of all the evilness, all the wickedness, I'm going to take it all and I'm going to put it in the land and then it's going to have to deal with me and I'm going to destroy it and it'll be no more. And for he says, uh, they're going to build a house for this sin and they're going to set it in there and it's going to remain there until God judges it. That's what he was showing them. Like, it's a lot of sin in this world, but it's going to remain here until I destroy it. So so don't you sweat it, because until I destroy it, it's here to stay. And, and remember, I told us New Birth House, similar to Zechariah and the book of Revelation uh, are in context because the, the judgment of Babylon, both spiritual and physical is brought uh, in both texts and Babylon remember is a type of the world and, and God wants us to be of the the world but not a, a, a part of the not he want, we're born in this world but he don't want us to be a, a part of the world be of this world he wants to be set apart and God is going to destroy all the evil in this world and we're blessed as believers because because we believe and have faith in Jesus, we're going to have a front row seat to all this. So everything that God is uh, showing him in this vision, we're going to have front row seats to uh, Jesus reign on earth during the revelation as believers. We don't have to fear being caught up or, or being a part of it. We get to watch it. We get to see God's glory. So as we continue to read the book of Zechariah, we can always remind ourselves that just like the book of Revelations, Zechariah talks about the first and second comings of Jesus Christ and how it will be done in even more uh, details than Revelations. And we can see in this chapter five and trust God in all the things uh, and know that in spite of all the evil, in spite of all the sin, in spite of all the lies, in spite of all the cheating, in spite of all the tests and trials, in spite of all uh, uh, trials and uh, tribulations, we know that God is in control. It, it doesn't matter uh, who, who dies in your family. It doesn't matter what sickness you may get. It doesn't matter what depression you may be going through. It doesn't matter what the struggle is. God is in control. And, and because we know that God is in control, we should be able to, in all situations and in everything, we should still be able to praise God. We should still be able to trust him. We should still be able to give to him. And we should still be able to surrender our all to him because we know that God will always take care of us. So as we get to chapter 6, I believe that was a great way in that vision to show us how I'm here to take care of you. I know what's going on around you. I see what you're going through. I know you've been in 70 years of captivity. I see all the evilness, the, the murders, the, 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 the rapings. I see the wickedness that you have to go against. And I, it's not going to uh, go, uh, and it's not unforgotten, but I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to handle it. And I, I'm going to take this sin that's in this world one day, and I'm going to destroy it all. And when we get to chapter six, it re, uh, in this chapter, we have the eighth and final vision that Zechariah received all in one single night. And can you imagine being Zechariah in, in this in these 14 chapters uh, receiving all these dreams and visions in one single night? 
and also being able to have the capability to remember these dreams and visions in great detail, how he did so vividly. I, I, I know I dreamed last night. Can't tell you what it was about. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing how he was able to, how God gave him that vision, and he knew God gave him that vision, and he was able to uh, tell us in such great detail. And this probably was, like I said, the longest night of Zachariah's life because in all these visions given to him, they were all speaking about the future history of Israel. So, you know, as he received these visions, you know he had to get up immediately write it down. He had to get, get, get immediately go tell and, and for they can uh, write it down and record these historical events. And here it is in verse 1. It says in, verse, in chapter 6, And I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came four chariots out from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of brass. Now, these mountains uh, weren't the physical mountains that you and I can see today, uh, but these, spiritual, these are spiritual mountains, and these are mountains of, of bronze and brass. And bronze and brass, remember, in Scripture, always relates and has connection to the meaning of sin. And this uh, has, then he goes on to see some more interesting things in this uh, vision and in this dream that God gave him. And look what he saw with these chariots in verses 2 through 5. Uh, really two through six, but verses two through five, it says, in the first chariot were red horses, in the second chariot, black horses, and in the third chariot, white horses, and in the fourth chariot, grizzled and bay horses. Then I answered and said unto the angel that talked with me, what are these, my Lord? And the angel answered and said unto me, these are the four spirits of heaven, of the heavens, which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. You see, as these four spirits, as we get to verses 6 through 8, we will see uh, the roles and the duties of these four spirits as well, what God has called them to do. Because in verse 6, uh, it just gives you de uh, details, not important, but it says, The black horses which are therein go forth into the north country, and the white go forth after them, and the grizzle go forth toward the south country. And he told us that because look what happens in verse uh, 7 and 8, because out of the four uh, or seven chariots, the ones that wasn't used was the red and bay uh, chariots, which is no importance, but look what he look how he ties this in in verse 7 and 8, where it says, And the bay went forth and sought to go that they might walk to and fro from the earth. And he said, Get ye hence, walk to and uh, through the earth. So... Uh, they walked to and fro through the earth. Then cried he upon me and spake unto me, saying, Behold, these that go toward the north country have quieted my spirit in the north country. You see, uh, just like Reverend uh, Dennis Carl Jones preached to us that Tuesday of our revival, saying uh, it's a bad thing, uh, it's a scary thing to make God mad, or, it, or it's a evil, it's a bad thing to make God mad. And we can see now, just like in Scripture, it's always been a scary and sad thing to uh, make God become angry or sad or disappointed in us. Because when he says he cried, uh, spake, saying, the north country have quieted my spirit, that's exactly what he meant. You see, God was saying that they have become at peace in their sins, and they have completely turned away from God. And, and that's what God is trying to tell us now. Don't, be, don't get so caught up in this world. Don't get so caught up in the sin of this world that, uh, that you, die, uh, to your, uh, you, you die to me to live to your flesh. Uh, and it's, we, I have to say that because we live in a, 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 this world is getting worse and worse. And it's never, to me, you know, the, uh, as men are supposed to be the leaders of, uh, of, the, of the household, men are supposed to be the leaders of the world. We're supposed to be the stronger uh, one of the two because we know that God has made the woman the weaker vessel. I cannot and will never understand uh, and will uh, I don't hold it to you. I'm not judging you. I uh, don't think I'm judging you when I look at you because I know life happens. But I, I, I will, will always let the man know that can have a baby but can't marry that woman. That I have no respect for you. I, I, my, my respect level is just, just dropped. If you, you can make a baby, but you can't marry her and, and, and raise this baby. I ain't got to get married just because I ha had no baby. That, yes, you do. Yes, you do. <laughs> if, if, if that's the guy, if that's what sign God needed to give to you to do the right thing because he know you wasn't thinking about it. He know you wasn't worried about it. He know you done died to your 
flesh. He know you didn't say, I don't care about no marriage. You ain't going to, uh, they always say, now I just got to tell y'all the lingo, you know, I'm cool enough to know. But they always say, uh, I ain't, that's just a trap. That's just paperwork. Marriage ain't nothing but paperwork. That you can't prove, prove that's me. Ah, you just don't, you just showing me your, your walk with Christ. You just showing me your relationship with God and, and the lack thereof. So uh, we need to continue to uh, try our best to live for him and never to 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 just be to to die uh, or to cut off our conscience to the Lord and continue to live in sin like we uh, know we're doing right when we know we're doing wrong. You see, God was speaking about the North Country, which represents Babylon. Once again, the type of the world. He was mad. He was speaking about Babylon. They done punished, and he was speaking about the Persian Empire. Y'all done came and took my people, my chosen people, and you don't think you wrong? You think what you're doing is right? I'm going to show you, and I'll let you do it for 70 years. I'll let you do it for 500 plus years, and you think it's going unnoticed. You think that I'm letting you get away with this, but... I have a place for you. Uh, heaven and hell is real. And there's a lot of people who don't b believe, and they're going to find out the hard way that, he that hell is where they're uh, about to go. And verse, <laughs> verse 9 through 11, it says uh, in, verse, uh, in chapter 6, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Take of them of the captivity, even of Helda and T Tobijah, and of Jediah, and which are come from Babylon, and come thou the same day, and go into the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. Then take the silver and gold, and make crowns, and set them upon the head of Joshua, the son of Josedach, the high priest. And speak unto him, saying, thus speaking the Lord. I went too far. We're going to stop at verse 11. See, God te always tells us to do something sometimes uh, that you know only God told me to do this. Uh, and a lot of times we can always tell when it's God speaking to us because when God is speaking to us, telling us to do something, I believe nine times out of ten that task normally may seem a little too difficult. When, when God is telling you to do something, normally he puts us in an awkward position or he puts us in an uncomfortable position to help demonstrate his power, to help demonstrate his glory. Uh, and he normally puts us in something that we probably ain't too comf confident doing. Uh, and that's because in everything and in every aspect of our life, I believe God wants us to know that he is in full control. That's why uh, he told Noah to build an ark even though it had never rained. But he told him to do something that he knew only God is talking to me. It's never rained before, and he's telling me to build this huge ark. So he knew he could trust God. And even Moses, as he told him to go uh, take my people, uh, out from, uh, free them from the hands of Pharaoh, he didn't want to uh, go into Egypt and do that, but that was uncomfortable for him. But he knew it had to be God speaking to him and then look at the position God put him in at the Red Sea. All these uh, miracles he was able to perform uh, for God. But here it is, another situation. I done finally freed him. We done finally left the land. And yet you done put me here in, all, in front of all this water. Where can we go? My enemy's right behind me. And he just said, stretch out thy hand and, and watch what I do for you. And then think of, even think about the woman with the issue of blood. And once again, God is going to put us in situations where it seems like he's not listening. It seems like uh, it's not fair, but all he's saying is trust me. She was dealing with that sickness and couldn't nobody help her. But she had to continue to trust in God, continue to lean on him. And just the touch of his him, him was able to save her. And then he uh, tells us how he thrives and excels in the moments where we are weakest and where we feel inadequate. You see, in, in order to, for our faith to grow and to develop, the Lord must te test our faith and to call us sometimes to do some things that we may not really want to do. Uh, our, taste, our faith must be tested. Uh, like, like I said Sunday, a faith, a faith that can't be tested is a faith that can't be trusted. So uh, we know that the trials and tribulations of life is something we have to go through. And he was telling him to make a crown and go crown Joshua uh, Cause, and that's how we know God was uh, just showing them a vision, but this is how we know God is always telling us. We can know that God is always telling us to do something uh, when it's something difficult to do nine times out of ten because to tell him to make a crown and go crown Joshua could have gotten him killed at that time because it was treason. You know, they were under the dominion of the Persian kingdom and during these visions. So 
But that's not what the Lord was doing here. See, that's not what the Lord, he means in this situation, because if we really pay attention to verse 11, when he says, place the crown on the head of Joshua, the high priest, we should know that a priest could never be kings by law during this time. A priest could never be a king because priests were to come from the line of Aaron and kings were to come from the line of David. But God is saying that this, God is saying this to uh, Zechariah because he was trying to paint the picture to Zechariah. He was trying to make it very clear to Zechariah that this is about my only begotten son, Jesus. This ain't about uh, the high priest Joshua, who I will use, who I am using now, but this is about uh, my son, Jesus. And look what it says in verse 12, where it says, And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. See, see how God always uh, points us to, to Christ. Uh, God always points us to Christ throughout Scripture. Scripture always points us to Jesus, and uh, that's why I will forever preach the gospel. I'll forever preach and teach uh, as long as God give me the strength. Uh, strength. I'll forever preach and teach as long as God give me the wisdom and, and the knowledge and the uh, ability to be able to stand before his people because we know that Jesus is the way, Jesus is the truth, and Jesus is the light. And that's why he references the branch, which we know in scripture the branch represents the messiah and, and remember in jeremiah 23 verse 5 through 6 it says behold the days come saith the lord that i will raise unto david a righteous branch and a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth and in his days judah shall be saved and israel shall dwell, dwell safely and this is his name whereby he shall be called the lord of righteousness then in Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 2, it says, There shall come forth a, a shoot from the stump of uh, Jesse, and the branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. And that's exactly what John the Baptist saw. Remember when he baptized Jesus. As soon as he baptized Jesus, he saw the Spirit of the Lord resting upon Jesus. So that t that's why he tells Zechariah in verse 12, to behold, a, a man whose name means the branch. Uh, and because Joshua is translated as uh, Ye Yahweh and Yeshua, is, uh, which means uh, Jesus. And Jesus also means Jehovah saves. So God picks this man who has the same name as his son, Joshua, who is a, a priest and who is going and he's now going to turn. He's going to make Jesus a priest and is going to make him king, which has never been done before, because in the millennial kingdom, Jesus will be the priest and the uh, king of, of all. Uh, he will be the ruler of all, showing us and giving us another preview of how God is always in the business of doing the impossible. A man said a, a king can't be a priest at the same time. Man said a priest can't be a king at the same time. God said, yes, he is. And you're going to put some respect on his name. And I'm sending him and you're going to see him reign for a thousand years in his millennial kingdom. I'm going to show every doubter. I'm going to show every hater. I'm, I'm going to show you all that what I said was true. You see, in verse 13 says, even he shall build the temple of the Lord and he shall bear the glory and he shall sit and rule upon his throne and he shall be a priest upon his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both. And, and it's important to know that God is not talking about a physical temple be, be building in this chapter but or in this verse. But God is talking to you and I in this verse because we are his temple that he's talking about now. And we are the individual temples of the Lord because his Holy Spirit is now with the, within us because of what he did on the cross. And God is continuously working in and through us each and every day through his Holy Spirit. And, and remember that they were here at uh, Zechariah, how God is working in and through us now. During these visions, they were in the middle of rebuilding the, the physical temple back in Israel and Judah. But now, but God is now speaking to them about a spiritual kingdom that is to come. And he speaks of uh, one who will come and receive the glory and he will be the king and he will be the priest who sits on his throne. You see, and then in verse 14, it says, uh, and he, the crowns shall be to Helam and to to Tobijah and to Jediah and to him, the son of Zephaniah for a memorial in the temple of the Lord. 
See, this proves and shows that God wasn't physically crowning their high priest, Joshua, but this was the crowning for Jesus, the, the true king who is to come. See, and, and, and God wanted them to make this crown, but God wanted them to make this crown. He was instructing them to make the crown of silver and gold because he wanted them to place it in the new temple that they were building to remind themselves of Jesus, who is the true king to come. So when you come in this temple, praise me for, for the works that I'm going to do, the works that you have not seen yet. Put your trust and faith in me and, and praise me for it because I'm going to do just what I said I'm going to do. And look what he said in verse 15, as we're getting ready to come to our close of today's lesson, it says, and then, and they, and they that are far off shall come and build in the temple of the Lord, and ye shall know that the Lord of hosts have sent me unto you. And this shall come to pass if ye will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. You see, this was explaining to us and to Zechariah today that, at the end, uh, during this tribulation, during this millennium kingdom, you're going to see how all the Jews, all the Gentiles will join in. All the people from Babylon and all the other places of the world are going to join in to help me rebuild my temple. And, and they're, for this was a prophetic reminder about how all the nations of the world are going to stream towards Israel at the very end of the tribulation period as we go into the millennial kingdom. And this was told to us by Haggai. This was told to us in scripture by Isaiah. This was told to us in scripture by Zechariah. And this was told to us through, in scripture commonly throughout all, through all the prophets. And, and because during the millennial kingdom, just as it gets started, after the tribulation period, all the nations of the earth will stream to Israel and they will bring their wealth to show their honor, to show their respect and to show their love for God and his temple. And, and aren't so when, when you know that now when you read these uh, scriptures uh, through Zechariah, when you understand what God is trying to teach us and show us, we can see how these are truly amazing visions and uh, amazing images of the future of what is to come. Because if we continue to read these chapters, which we will, as we continue to study Zechariah, we will see that these visions and these prophecies that we're reading, they're just going to continue to get better and better and better. We're going to be able to understand what God is going to do so we don't have to worry about the tribulation in the millennial kingdom because we're going to be in, in in glory with jesus we're just going to get the front row seats to it all because we put our trust and faith in you and i don't know about you uh i stopped going to movies because a lot going on that movie you, you know so sometimes babies crying so, uh, uh when i went you know I, I grew up at the age where in lancaster movies uh over there off pleasant run it go down you know i i learned at 13 14 if i'm girl, taking a girl on a date we ain't going to lancaster the movies <laughs> we'll go to see the hill <laughs> we'll go to grand prairie but we ain't going to lancaster movies because anything could happen and but i can't wait to see this great movie i, I can't wait to see this great show with no interruptions no no I, I can't wait to see god's amazing power there for in zachariah he tells us exactly where he is coming back to reign We'll see as we study this, we're going to know exactly where his future kingdom, where his uh, temple and where his city without walls will be. We know it's going to be exactly in Israel. We know he's going to reign in Judah. He's going to show us exactly where he'll be in Jerusalem. And I'm so glad that God has prepared a perfect place. I'm so glad that God has prepared the, the perfect kingdom for all of us who believe and put our trust and faith in him for, on his, for his death, burial, and resurrection from the, from the cross and from the grave, a death on the cross and resurrection from the grave. And I, uh, I'm so glad that he's created a place where there'll be no more sickness. He's created a place where there'll be no more pain, no more suffering, no more worry, no more bills, no more, uh, no more uh, real job. We'll just be working for the Lord. We'll just be praising the Lord and giving our best to him because we are and we'll be able to enjoy and reap the benefits of the blessing the benefits of the love of putting our trust and faith in Jesus uh, and that's why we should continue to come out to uh, read about uh, Zachariah to see what is God up to because uh, we know God is just up to something and, and as we're reading these visions as we're uh, seeing how God is creating the perfect home we will be able to see this perfect city one day and we're going to be able to see Jesus reign on his throne as king and, and priest of, of the land that's why as believers we don't have to give up the faith 
We don't have to fall out of fellowship with God. Uh, we don't have to give up when things are go when we're going through different trials and tribulations. Uh, we don't have to give up and fall out of fellowship with the Lord when our marriages are being attacked, when our children are being disobedient, when, when we're, we're going through financial struggles, when we're struggling to find a job, or if you're struggling to find a home, or if you're just struggling with sin, rather it be gambling, rather it be lust of the flesh, rather it be struggling not to have sex, struggling not to smoke, struggling not to drink, uh, struggling not to have a jealous mind, struggling not to gossip. Whatever your struggle is, don't fall out of fellowship with the Lord. Just get on your knees and ask God for forgiveness. Repent and he will set you free, you know, no matter the situation. We got to always know that uh, we is we will be just fine because of God's grace. And no matter the situation, we got to know that God's grace is sufficient. And it's sufficient enough and it's more than enough to always see us through. And all we have to do is keep our eyes on the hills which come with our help, which is the Lord, just like Israel. They had to continue to keep their eyes on God. They had to continue to keep their eyes on God as they were rebuilding this temple. Because as they were rebuilding this temple, they had to continue to keep the faith because they had to deal with people complaining. They had to deal with the quitters who said, I'm done. This is ugly. It ain't the same. This is stupid. We're wasting our time. They had to ignore even their own self-doubt within themselves. Everyone's saying this is pointless. Everyone's quitting on me left and right. People saying I'm wasting my time. But he had to keep the faith. He had to continue to do what God told him to do and trust that God would do as he said and and God told him I'm just using you you're just the tools I'm using but I'm rebuilding this temple you're just the tools that I'm using to do it but it's me and they're going to see my power when it's all said and done and he, he explained to them how I have the power to set you just the same the same power that I had to set you free from captivity the same power that I had uh, that set you free from slavery is the same power that I have to send my son Jesus to die on the cross and, and to arise again on the third day for I just justification so that we can be saved. So Zachariah, you continue to tell the people. You continue to rebuild my, my temple. You continue to live for me. And, and you continue to do your best for me. Uh, live your best life for Christ. Give me the best of your time, talent, and treasure. And in Zachariah's time, the best of his time, talent, and treasure, what God was telling him to do was rebuild my temple. And, and continue to preach my, my word, teach my word to the people. And now it's our time, new birth. Uh, I'm, I'm so glad that God has us here because as pastor I know yes uh, we got some work to do uh, we got some rebuilding to do ain't, ain't no more trash cans in the middle of this sanctuary because it's raining we got some work to do uh, it, it, it ain't no more cracked uh, pavement outside we got some work to do it, it's something it ain't no more coming to new birth at night and the light the street uh, the, the lamp light don't work we got some work to do uh, it's the carpet in here it's been here since I was a little boy we got some work to do new birth the job ain't done at the bathrooms. We got some work to do. Uh, the, the job never ceases. We are continuing to work and, God, uh, and rebuild God's temple. But he wants us to know that there is two temples that he cares about the most. He cares about you. You are his temple. We are his temple. This is his body. And, and he has given us the Holy Spirit to learn how to lean and depend on him for everything. And treat his temple with respect. Uh, and, and treat his temple with honor and, and give his temple to him. That's why I said earlier, and I'm going to die on it. I'm going to stand on business just like they stand on it. I'm going to stand on if you can lay with her, you can marry her. You can make a ba baby, you can marry her. Now, yes, you have the option to divorce, but just like my wife, she can't go nowhere. She's stuck. I'm stuck. We, we love each other. And, and it's, it's a good love. And it's a great fear of God to know that I love you and you love me. And right now we might just be having some differences. You just might not like, I, you don't like the way I do this. I don't like the way you do that. But guess what? We're going to work it out. Uh, we ain't going over. Uh, uh, We're going to always work it out. And that's because we respect our temple. We respect our body. We made a sacrifice to give our bodies to God. We made a sacrifice that I, she know new birth. If I die right now, y'all better not let her marry. She can't marry nobody else. <laughs> no, I done set it up just like my dad. You should be good, baby. You don't need nothing. <laughs> so, uh, but that's the type of love we should have. And then secondly, God wants us to love his temple, his whole, his church. 
uh, respected. Uh, and he wants us to be constantly focused on making it better. That's why we have the youth ministry. Uh, that's why we have all the different auxiliaries here at the church. But we can see every day when we come to this building that there is work to be done. And as long as there's work to be done, then guess what, New Birth? That means we got a job to do. So, and our job right now is to focus on rebuilding this temple. This, 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 this body, bodily temple that God gave us and this, uh, ch this church uh, body, this temple, this, we are going to fix it up in God's way, in God's image, and we're going to follow his will. So thank you so much for listening today. Uh, I hope you took something and was able to learn something about focusing on our, the temple that God wants us to rebuild and, most important, the, the tasks and the duties that he's called us all to do. So... Thank you so much for those who are online as well listening. And now let us get ready to give our online benediction and don't leave. Uh, we'll have offering and then I'll pray for us inside and then we'll go. Uh, Father God, thank you so much for allowing us to come out today, Lord, to hear a word, Lord. Uh, I ask you just to apply this word to our life, Lord, and I ask you just to let us be willing, ready, and able to do what you've called us to do for the work of the Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus that I pray, amen.